Hello, everyone. I welcome you to the seventh episode of Unmute, an interview series with creative writers, an initiative of All India Forum for English students, scholars, and trainers. It is my privilege to welcome Professor Nandini Sahu as our guest today. Hello, ma'am. Hello. Now, I would like to give our viewers a short introduction for Professor Nandini Sahu so that they get to know their guest better. Professor Nandini Sahu is a major voice in contemporary Indian English literature. She has accomplished her doctorate in English literature from Vishwabharati Shantiniketan. She has been widely published in India, USA, UK, Africa, Italy, Australia, and Pakistan. Apart from numerous other literary awards, she is a triple gold medalist in English literature. She has received the gold medal from the Honorable Vice President of India for her contributions to English studies in India in the year 2019. She is the author and editor of 20 books, some of which I would like to show you on screen now. Postmodernist Delegation to English Language Teaching, The Quixotic Deluge, The Other Voice, a collection of poems, The Postcolonial Space, Writing the Self and the Nation, Folklore and the Alternative Modernities, Sukama and other poems, Suvarna Rekha, which is an anthology of Indian women poets writing in English, Sita, a poem, as you can see, this poem has been translated into Hindi, as are some of her other books. Then there is Zero Point, a collection of poems, a song, Half and Half, which is subtitled as Love Poems. Then rereading Jayanta Mahapatra, and you can see on screen the beloved poet from Odisha with Professor Nandini Sahu, who is sadly no more, but always present in our memories and in our readings. You can also see Professor Sahu with the master storyteller from Odisha, Sri Manoj Das, who is also no more, but is ever present in the academic arena in the literary world. And on the right hand side, you can see the launch of a recent book of stories, Shedding the Metaphors, and that is the book we will be talking about today. And it's being launched by the Honorable Minister of Education, Sri Dharmendra Pradhanji. And Shedding the Metaphors, as you can see the cover page on screen, and there was a seminar on this book at the University of Delhi. And you can see ma'am with the Honorable Vice Chancellor of the University of Delhi. Then, these are only some of the works from her huge body of works which we would want our viewers to find out and explore. I must tell you that Professor Nandini Sahu is the former director, School of Foreign Languages, and currently a professor of English at Indira Gandhi National Open University, New Delhi. Her areas of research interest cover Indian literature, new literatures, indigenous knowledge systems, American literature, children's literature, and critical theory. She is the chief editor of, and founder editor of Interdisciplinary Journal of Literature and Language, a biannual peer-reviewed journal in English. Professor Sahu has designed multiple academic programs on folklore and culture studies, some of which you can see on screen 
tradition, identity, and cultural production. These are some of the courses which she had introduced. She has introduced Indian folk literature, folklore, canon, multimediality, interdisciplinarity, and social epistemology. Theories and pedagogy of folklore. These are some of the courses that she has introduced. And apart from this, she has designed multiple academic programs on American literature, post-colonial literatures, British poetry, children's literature, and Indian philosophical thoughts for IGNU and many other universities. Currently, she is designing a course on Indian knowledge systems, which is inclined to comparative Indian literatures and Hindu studies. So we are delighted to welcome uh, Professor Nandini Sahu to Unmute interview series. And we hope this conversation will be thought provoking and will be encouraging for us at IFEST and also for our viewers who have joined us today. Welcome ma'am to our show. And at this point, if you'd like to say something uh, to the viewers, you're welcome to do so. Thank you very much, uh, Dr. Satirupa. Uh, I must thank you for inviting me to have a dialogue with you in this program, Unmute, which sounds very interesting. So let's hope that we are going to have some engaging conversation with you. Thank you. Definitely, ma'am. And I would like to begin now because I cannot wait to hear from you thoughts about your stories uh, because we are going to talk about shedding the metaphors and it's a really interesting title, I must say. But at the beginning, I would like to talk about being in the literary field in general. You have had a long experience of teaching uh, students and interacting with them and also a long experience in exploring your own creative side. And at this uh, point, I would like to bring in some thoughts by Neil Gaiman, which I enjoyed reading in a book titled Art Matters. And I, I feel this is a good book. Right. Art Matters, he says, First of all, when you start on a career in the arts, you have no idea what you are doing. This is right. great. Right. People who know what they are doing, know the rules and know what is possible and impossible, you do not and you should not. The rules on what is possible and impossible in the arts were made by people who had not tested the bounds of the possible by going beyond them and right. you can if you don't know it's impossible it is easier to do and because nobody has done it before they haven't made up rules to stop anyone doing that again yet so let us begin with this thought i find it very beautiful and i would like to ask you how did you get into the writing process? I mean, teaching is very different from sitting down with your pen and crafting stories and bringing poems uh, into shape. So right. how, how did you begin writing and how do you look at yourself as a writer? Uh, well, thank you so much, uh, Dr. Satarupa. This question is really vast. I don't know how to put it uh, uh, in the black and white or how to talk about it within a few sentences. But anyway, let us make an attempt. Uh, the great masters have written somewhere that uh, read a hundred books and your world is flooded with words. Any creative writer needs to read a lot. So probably I have this habit since my childhood about reading. You can see my library as the backdrop to, to this conversation as well. I have this personal library with thousands of books and I think I have been only reading since my childhood. Uh, I was introduced to the great masters of literature uh, in the, when I was in class 4th or class 5th in my childhood and 
in one of my interviews, I was talking about that and how my father used to take me to his high school library and I was his librarian. I used to create catalog of his books. Of, he was a school teacher and the school library catalog was basically prepared by me until today they preserve that. So I started reading uh, autobiographies, biographies, books from history and culture, even homeopathy. And in due course of time, I started reading fiction. I read so much of poetry, so much of fiction, and then I started writing. Uh, and my first book was published in uh, 2004. Now, I already you have shown the cover of that book, uh, The Silence. It was a poetry collection. And then after that, I kept on writing and there was never any looking back. Writing is my therapy. Uh, writing is my only way of expression. I need to write in order to uh, uh, to engage myself with the universe. And I need to write in order to uh, grow as an individual. And to write, I have to read a lot, isn't it? Uh, so uh, I keep on reading and writing. And most of the books you have already shown um, the audiences out of the 20 books, uh, maybe some just, uh, 10 to 12 books you have already discussed with them. And uh, uh, when I look at my first poetry book, uh, the silence and today when I look at my most important poetry book Sita this is this is the book Sita when I look at this book I find uh, that I have evolved uh, not only as a writer but uh, as a human being uh, I have become more uh, flexible more inclusive more positive to life I am non-judgmental so in my book zero point that's again another poetry collection where I'm talking about, uh, uh, I'm at the zero point of my life. Now, what is the zero point? You may ask me. Uh, zero, the idea of zero, I have taken from uh, the Upanishads. Zero is the highest number, and it is also the lowest number. You have to find the zero of your life. If you go on putting zeros to the positive side, to the right side of your life, which is like, you add love, you add, you add compassion, kindness, inclusivity, you, you add knowledge and wisdom, then your life, the value of your life keeps on increasing. But if you put the zeros in the left side of your life, like hatred, anger, and you know, being dismissive about people, a lot of things are there, unkind behavior, then probably the zero of your life uh, remains a zero, it, it remains the lowest number. You will never grow as an individual. So I think for uh, me and for many writers, creative writing is a therapy. We grow as individuals uh, when we write. And, uh, this is my only strategy, survival strategy. And this is the only thing that I know how to do. Thank you. That was a beautiful answer, ma'am. And well, I particularly liked the word <laughs> evolving. Because uh, that is something which we aim at. Uh, I mean, right. Evolution uh, is something we have studied as a process of biology. But that is something we like to feel, we like to see in ourselves. And especially for a creative writer, evolving is very important. And uh, it is something which is part of the journey of any writer. And uh, I'm glad that you bring in the idea of writing as therapy as well, because uh, indeed writing is therapeutic and we tend to deal with or engage with a lot of contradictory feelings that we have in the course of even a day or in, in the course of even an hour. We try to deal with those contradictory feelings within us through our writing. And as you rightly said, that this is a sort of process which is never ending and it will keep on uh, refashioning itself, this process of writing and thinking about your own writing. It will keep on evolving even that process till right. the end of time. Right. So that was lovely. Right. Now we will move on to the title of your collection of short stories. Interestingly, it is titled Shedding the Metaphors. Right. And I would like to uh, just bring in here uh, the book, Metaphors We Live By, 
by George Lakoff and Mark Johnson. It, it's a book which uh, tells us how uh, basically our language is metaphoric because our thought processes are uh, you know, built with metaphors. And um, just uh, I, I was thinking of how we would look at something basic like memory uh, and these uh, thoughts uh, came to mind. I, I was reminded of something I had read in a book that if we think of something basic like memory, we would think of archives and libraries. We would think of uh, wine houses and uh, you know warehouses where goods are stored. We would think of uh, aviaries, for example, where uh, you know birds they are kept together. Right. And then, of course, treasure chests and vaults where valuables are kept. And then, of course, we would associate memory with a leather purse, which right. we use for storing our money. Right. So, apart from this, we can also think of memory in terms of labyrinths, if we think about the extensiveness of memory, labyrinths right. or woods, fields. And if we think about the hidden nature of memory, even we will think of caves, grottoes, and depths of sea. So uh, I find this interesting. While you have used metaphors in your stories and your stories have included some beautiful metaphors, how did you think of naming your collection, Shedding the Metaphors? Okay, Dr. Satarupa, this is such an interesting question. I must say that you know how to unmute authors, isn't it? You know how to take the best out of them. So probably you are asking such tricky uh, and very, very critically engaging questions. Uh, when you talked about uh, memory, I was reminded before I get into this book, Shedding the Metaphors, uh, today's discussion is basically on this book, Shedding the Metaphors. But before that, please allow me to talk about um, uh, uh, you know, what do I exactly mean by metaphors and how memory and nostalgia, archiving and documentation, these things are so very important for me. Today, I remember uh, this Delhi University seminar uh, on this book launch, uh, which you have already discussed in the beginning, when Professor Yogesh Singh, he was launching the book and then he talked about that book uh, in detail. So one of the teachers of Delhi University, she was very, uh, what should I say, she was very upfront and she told me, a writer is all about metaphors. Professor Sahu, how do you even propose to shed any metaphor? If you shed the metaphors, what remains for you to write? And uh, I just smiled because she was right in her own way. A writer is all about metaphors. Like Walt Whitman, I think that uh, a book is always work in progress. Like this book, Sita, that I told you now, uh, there is one of my most important books. It was initially published in 2015. And today, if you ask me to write another Sita, uh, I think the text will be entirely different. And if you ask me to rewrite uh, my first book, The Other Voice, I think it will be entirely different. So like a writer keeps on growing and evolving, a book should also be allowed to evolve. That's why Walt Whitman said that I sing of myself, uh, I celebrate myself because the autumn belonging to me as good belongs to you. By saying that, probably he meant about the universality of the emotions in any kind of creative writing. So when you read Sita or when you read Shedding the Metaphors, if you are able to see yourself in one of the characters, and then you forget Nandini, death of the author. You just forget the author. Now you become one with the character. You see yourself in Semita of the first story, or you see yourself in any particular character in the last story, which is my memoir, being God's wife. If you look at yourself as God's wife, I think that is the success of uh, a story writer, that the, the reader uh, tends to forget the writer. The writer doesn't come between the reader and the text. That is one thing. And as far as my uh, ideas of preserving and documenting things go on, uh, since my childhood, I have been a great preserver. I would always preserve things. Uh, when I was in the kitchen, I was hardly 12, 15 years old, and I, I loved to cook. I would go to the kitchen to help my mother. Uh, 
and then when i am from a very large family so uh, at the end of the day when my mother would have given food to everybody only very little of anything precious anything good say pakodas or say something very interesting something good would be left for my mother i noticed that quite a few times and then i decided that when she starts cooking i would just take a bit of the best dish put it in a katori put it in a small box and hide it uh, behind the behind the, the chula behind the hearth and then after the entire family has finished their lunch or dinner and my mother was completely exhausted and then she tried to take things in her plate and very little of pakoda was left for her then i would take out that box and say mama i had preserved this one for you so that habit of archiving documenting preserving things for the future for the progeny probably that made me a folklorist another childhood incident you know uh, i used to when i was small i am from a family of six girls and then i used to go to get pakoda for the entire family from the shop of somebody named uh, jagabhaina and then uh, uh, i used to get pakoda for uh, 75 paise out of 1 rupee at that time 1 rupee for 1 rupee would get so much of a pakoda isn't it in the 80s so uh, i used to get a pakoda for 75 paise and then that another 25 paise would always be missing and my my mother was very upset with me because i told her ma this is pakoda for 75 paise then she would say where is another 25 uh, then i would just keep quiet i would never answer to that and then at the cost of being scolded by my mother i never responded to that 25 paise then what happened after a few years uh, they were cleaning uh, cleaning the drains in front of the houses the the town planning was going on and then when they lifted a big stone in front of our house they called that a slab or something they removed that slab they found so many 25 paise coins in one particular place so i used to drop that 25 paisa there without thinking what is going to happen of that money and then they found so much of money and then they told me it's you right and i i gave it to my father i told him baba please keep this money and do something with that and they were so happy now uh, they said you have you have been preserving money there for what i said i don't know for what i thought something should be kept so i always thought about the rainy day we should keep something good for the rainy day maybe this is what made me an archivist a person who loves documentation a person who loves folklore so when you showed some of my folklore courses this is one of the courses of folklore uh, out of uh, the 12 courses that i have on folk literature uh, well I- I'll go to that as well. When I came to Igno as a professor in the year two thousand and six, uh, I discovered that we had all kinds of courses. You are in the English department, so you will also know that the so-called mainstream courses are like American literature, British literature, Canadian studies, everything, but never Indian folk literature. Indian folk literature has always been a part of our marginal studies, isn't it? You will agree with that. Uh, so I proposed PG diploma in folklore studies in the year two thousand and seven. and by 2008 the diploma was launched and couple of years ago uh, the ma in folk literature was launched and i designed all the 10 courses uh, by myself without any collaboration it was so difficult it was a herculean challenge to design a course a program on folk literature with near about 20000 pages in print in in our university when we launch a program we have to actually write the material with zero plagiarism we don't have just one page syllabus and go to the classroom before we go to the classroom or we go online we have to design the material right like this we have to write and then edit and then print and as a passionate writer i think igno was the best place for me igno has given me the platform to do my research and write so i proposed and launched ma in folk literature also mag 16 indian folk literature is a part of our ma english so introducing folk literature as a part of ma english again was a herculean task people were not willing to take folk literature as a part of ma english but ultimately it happened by the grace of god and now oh, i am working on a course on hindu studies we already mentioned that i am working on a course on the epics and puranas and siddhantas like surya siddhant pancha siddhant siddhant shiromani uh, so i am working on that course for the students of engineering and technology so i am taking 
the students of science and technology towards Indian knowledge systems. It is a value-based course. Now, ask me what is the connection between mythology and science and technology? Uh, if you go through Indian mythology and Siddhantis and Puranas very carefully, you will see that our Puranas are very scientific. Most of the ideas are very scientific. So the geometrical patterns of the Chakravya, one of the chapters is on that. How Abhimanyu gets into in the Mahabharata. Abhimanyu gets into the Chakravya, but he cannot come out of the Chakravya. Maybe because he had understood only half of the geometrical pattern of the Chakravya. He, he had not understood the entire thing. He hadn't understood 100%. So he could not come out of that. So the chapter focuses on the geometry, the science and technology behind some parts of the Mahabharata. Even I'm in one of the chapters, I'm talking about the Pushpak Vimana and aviation. So aviation is something very, very old. Again, uh, in one of the chapters, I'm talking about Sushrut and Indian uh, medical sciences and how they were a part of our Indian knowledge systems and Hindu studies and Puranas. And now they have influenced the contemporary uh, civilization. So this is how, you know, when I work on mythology uh, or, or Indian knowledge systems or anything on Hindu studies, I try to be very, very scientific because I'm a very thorough researcher. I'm a serious researcher unless I'm convinced in my mind. I will not get into that kind of research. So uh, writing this text, shedding the metaphors, uh, I was shaped as a person who is into documentation, archiving, folklore, uh, Indian knowledge systems, and Hindu studies and comparative Indian literatures. I have read hundreds and thousands of books before I got into writing this uh, book, Shedding the Metaphors. Now, three of my books are already under publication. The second story collection, which I'm yet to find a title. Now, another 12, other 12 stories are ready to be published. And my poetry collection, Kurt, is ready to be published. And one book, uh, Indian Knowledge Systems, is ready to be published. Uh, 15 chapters I have written on Indian Knowledge Systems, and that is ready to be published. And I think in January or February next year, that book will again be launched, and I will uh, keep you informed. And now, uh, let me come to your question. What do I mean by shedding the metaphors? Uh, can you allow me to, to read just a couple of lines from the preface? Uh, what do I mean by shedding the metaphors? Please, ma'am, please. That yes, would be sure. interesting. OK. Uh, now I realize one sheds all metaphors when life comes to a full circle. It is a new beginning, being inclusive, empathetic, universal, accepting, reconciling, and persistent. At such a landmark, one stops misconstruing and misapprehending. Now life is about evasion of delusions and reception of the present time in its multiple sheds. Now one is complete. It's a commencement. At the same time, it is the end. It's the mode of nirvana, all inclusive, nihilistic, irrationally rational, non-judgmental, romantic. It is difficult to contain all such finer metaphors of one life in this living, thus shedding the metaphors and shedding my id, ego and super ego. Now I am the Brahma. Now I am a clean slate. I write with an all embracing rhythmical imagining like an enormous river that conveys in its curve plentiful tribulations. I decline no knowledge. I discount nothing. Endeavor veracity in its enigmatic complexity. Precisely, I am shedding all the metaphors attached to me in the past, present, and future. Like T.S. Eliot, I sing, quote unquote, time present and time past are both perhaps present in time future, and time future contained in the time past. If all time is eternally present, all time is unredeemable. So I'm trying to keep all time together, time that is unredeemable. I'm trying to contain the entirety of time in one book and I'm shedding all my judgments, my ego and super ego. Now I'm just a Brahma. You ask me whatever you want to ask. I am truth. So this is what I mean in this book. 
very interesting indeed. And I can see why you are attracted to Indian knowledge systems as a researcher. And I feel that you have worked hard uh, in utilizing the opportunity that IGNU gave you because you have Absolutely. responded to that opportunity and you have in turn opened up opportunities for students uh, that they would not have otherwise got. It's true, ma'am, that uh, folklore studies, Indian folklore in particular, uh, has not received uh, that kind of attention in the academic circles, but I am sure that with your efforts and with efforts of other uh, researchers who, who are working in this field, folklore will become an emerging field of study. It is an emerging field of studies. And uh, you know, I know uh, of certain people who have uh, done a lot of research in this area and they are very excited at the prospects that uh, this field opens up for researchers. So yes. that was really interesting to know about all your efforts at IGNU towards uh, increasing the importance of folklore studies in India. And the way you linked shedding the metaphors with Nirvana, that is something which uh, is very beautiful. That idea is very beautiful. And I'm sure our viewers would want to find out what it is like to shed the metaphors while reading your stories, which have very interesting titles. And at this point, I would just like to read out the titles of all your stories for our viewers. Yes. <laughs> A very different story. That is the first story in this collection, followed by alternative masculinity, echoing in a lullaby, shadow of a shadow, that elusive orgasm, the juvenile love letter, the quarantined, post-quarantine, the scarlet fly, octopus, the wild stream, and being God's wife. All the stories are titled in such interesting ways. They pick our interest immediately when we just go through the contents page. And that is something which shows your expertise with language and of course with metaphors. So you have to be an expert at met metaphors before, before you realize what it is like to shed the metaphors. So that was a very beautiful answer, ma'am. And you also talked of how your experience in dealing with mythology, with folklore, uh, has given a different uh, taste, a different shape uh, to your writing. And uh, I would agree, I would mention uh, that story, the that elusive orgasm. And I want to ask you, what was the importance of including a story within a story. The story of how Sonagachi in North Kolkata is named after the dacoit turned Saint Sanaula. And you know, how, how, how do you think of introducing such a story within your narrative and uh, how, how does it feel like including myths and legends which also have the habit of changing themselves over time myths they undergo changes and they um, they are also adapted and with time they acquire different connotations so what it is like using such myths and legends in your stories i would like to know well dr satarupa uh, when you asked the question i am afraid you answered uh, yourself in the beginning you said that um, in order to share the metaphors one has to be an expert of uh, metaphors, first of all. So these kind of metaphors I use, maybe you can say I, I use it very cleverly uh, as a writer. I just want to play with so the mind of the reader and take the reader to another level uh, of expectation. And then the twist is what the reader is expecting, the story may not be about that. When you read the title, that elusive orgasm, uh, the, the title may sound uh, deceptively simple, 
uh, one can think, uh, okay, she's writing about orgasm of a woman and uh, a very beautiful orgasm and a woman expects that uh, with every time that she gets into that intimate relationship, the reader can expect that. But as I said, or as you said, let me quote you, that uh, I use uh, mythology uh, in both its shapes, in its positive aspects, like uh, in Indian mythology, such beautiful things are there. Uh, in the course that I'm designing now on Hindu studies, uh, I have taken things like Sarala Das's Mahabharat. Uh, so Vyasadeva's Mahabharat, people have read. But Sarala Das's Mahabharat, which is so unique, such interesting and unique features are there, which are not there in Saral Das Mahab, in, in the Vyasadev Mahabharat. For example, the story of the Kokua, Kokua Bhai. So nobody except Uriya Mahabharat, or nobody except Uri people will understand what is Kokua Bhai, isn't it? Or Nabagunja Rabesha. So the, the nine animals coming together, you will see the painting Nabagunja in all the temples in Odisha. So somehow I have taken Kokua and Nabagunjara kind of characters or imaginary characters created by Lord Krishna and I have compared them with WBH's uh, poem Second Coming. The w second, uh, second Coming, the poem says that uh, turning and turning in the widening jaya, the falcon cannot hear the falcon. So mere anarchy has come up. So in order to handle that anarchy, Christ or Antichrist, an animal, or a human being, somebody who has the head of a man and body of a lion is coming uh, and then uh, people are so scared of uh, that animal or, or that creature. Similarly, in, in Saral Das's Mahabharat, Kokua and Nabogunjar kind of imaginary characters are there who, who are actually the game changers. They have completely changed the course of Indian mythology. Like after this Kokua, Lord Krishna is you know, he's instrumental in, in finishing the Yadav Kul uh, through the Kokwa Bhai. And then he is taking rest in the forest when the Zara Sabar, he comes and then he shoots an arrow to the foot, left foot of Lord Krishna. And then his soul remains. And the soul is taken to forest. Zara Sabar keeps the soul in, in the form of Mila Madhav in the jungle for 100 years. After which... Uh, Nila Madhav has to come as the mainstream god, Lord Jagannath, to Puri. That's a long story in, in Uriya uh, Jagannath cult. So I have tried to take those kind of stories, how Lord Jagannath has tribal associations, the connections with the tribal community. The tribal king, they had, they had kept Lord Jagannath in the forest. And the king of Puri, he took Nila Madhav from them by some means that all of us know. So those kind of stories I have incorporated in my courses and also like Balaram Das's Ramayan, Jagamohan Ramayan, or I have taken Chandi Purana, I have taken Lakshmi Purana. In the text Lakshmi Purana, you talk about gender equality, you talk about caste equality. So Sriya Chandraluni, she is a Sudra woman and Goddess Lakshmi goes to her house and he takes food in her house. And then after that Lord Jagannath and Balabhadra, they try to give some punishment to Lakshmi in the Lakshmi Puran. And then what happens, we know that they have to forgive her. Forgive is a wrong word. They have to accept uh, Lakshmi with all her ideas of taking food in uh, anybody's house, in the house of the so-called lower caste. So I have taken those kind of positive aspects of Indian mythology, Puranas and Hindu studies in the courses I have taken. But this is a story where I'm also talking about the darker side of uh, pseudo-religion. I won't say religion, but pseudo-religion. So here is a father who wants to have sex with his own daughter uh, in this story, that elusive orgasm. Because this person, uh, his wife, uh, she was on the wheelchair and he could not have anything with her. And the wife wanted to protect the family property. So look at the politics here the body politics, you, you just see here that the mother, she doesn't want her husband to remarry or find another woman and find his sexual uh, you know, satisfaction from another woman. She sacrifices her own daughter to her husband. And then they make her a victim of being the prasad of goddess Kali, Bhadra Kali. 
So this is not written in a religion. This is the negative mentality of a person. No religion says that you should sacrifice your own daughter. And then he exploits the daughter for a few years, sexually exploits. But then in the process, the twist of the story is orgasm. The little girl who is a victim of sexual violation in the first few years of her early youth, suddenly she becomes so addicted to getting orgasms from her own father that her entire life is devastated. She is helped by some of her old friends. She is sent back to some other country to settle down, to marry somebody, to start a life of her own. But she can never do that because the moment she gets into any kind of intimate relationship with her husband, she just remembers her early youth where she was getting orgasms out of that incest of father-daughter. And then she comes back and the story is really dark, isn't it? It's a very, very disturbing story. Whenever I read this story, I just pray, how could I even write this? I wrote it at one go. One day at five o'clock in the morning, I just remembered the girl and I sat down to write. By 6.30, the, source, the story was finished. It, it has never been edited. I just wrote and I sent it because if I would have read the story again, I won't have allowed anyone to publish it because this is such a painful story. Now, whenever I read that story, I get so much pain here. And I'm sure that all my readers, in fact, uh, after the book was published, more than 25, 30 reviews have come. Uh, eminent professors and many people have written reviews on the book and everyone has talked about this story. They started reading the story, elusive orgasm. Oh, what orgasm she is talking about? They start reading. Well, now coming to your question. Why did I introduce the story within a story? That Sonagat's story. Well, that is to give about the, the topography, the topography of a place. Right? The, the story is uh, situated in West Bengal, and uh, Sonagachi is a place which is uh, famous, or it has the ill fame, or whatever you can say, about uh, uh, the maximum number of uh, sex workers being there. So, in a city where sex workers are available, or they are willingly doing that kind of a service where the father could have actually got into any kind of sex worker had he wished to do so. It would have been very easy for him, but he chose to sacrifice his own daughter. So that can be one reason why I gave this background. The other reason can be I was creating a very complex background to the story that sex plays such an important role in a society, whereas people are rather silent about it. We have zipped our mouth about it. No one talks about orgasms. Like many people told me, even some of my senior colleagues told me, Nandani, please change the title of the story. Even one journal, I won't name the journal, that is India's most famous journal. It's a government, uh, it, it comes from a government press. Okay, I sent the story to him. And then the person, the editor, he read the story. He said, it's an interesting story. You have taken out a very important subject, but change the title of the story. Make it the girl child. I said, why? Then he says, uh, we don't want to use the word orgasm as a title of one of our stories. Because people will think that ours is a journal related to pornography. No, orgasm is not porn, isn't it? That's just one of the human activities. But people have to open up. People have to talk about most uncomfortable things. Once I heard from the editor of that government-based journal, the chief editor, I was more determined to keep that title. I thought, no, let the title go like this. Let people think that I'm talking about something very, very inconvenient, uncomfortable, because a writer has to deal with the discomfort of himself or herself, and also the discomfort of the readers. And you will be inclusive only when you get above those. You get over, you get above, and you are not uncomfortable with any kind of word anymore. So maybe that is the reason why I talked about Sonagachi. I am not sure if you are convinced. I'm convinced, ma'am, and I, I agree, you know, when I was reading your stories, this was a story which uh, had a different impact on me. And after I completed reading that story, I was afraid of the word prasada. And 
to be, to be honest, I was really afraid of uh, those belief systems which make people blind and uh, they don't understand the spirit behind a word like prasada. And as you rightly said, people manipul manipulate these concepts that are there. Yes. And, yes. Uh, you know, they misunderstand, they misconstrue and they manipulate these concepts. And then we have a story like that elusive orgasm, which... We should, should not talk about this story anymore, but I would I would want the readers to just go and read that story because after after that story, the last line where the friend has a lump in her throat, I think all the readers will only have lumps in their throats after reading that story. As you said, it's such a painful story and the word orgasm is very important for the title because just as you know sexual relationship in this story is important in the same way we have another kind of deprivation of a sexual relationship in the first story where uh, professor madhvi she is deprived of that satisfaction in her second marriage and then she is also silent about it for a long time, just because she wants her son to have a stable father. So, as you rightly said, this urge to censure language, creative language, many a time it harms creativity itself. And such a kind of attitude of not taking a word as it is, I mean, we want to have an orgasm, but we don't want to talk about it. Right. And we don't want our story to have such a title. I think yes. that is unfortunate. And it was very, very nice of you and very, you know, strong of you, I would say, to just stick <laughs> to uh, your title and uh, okay. not be willing to change it. Okay. So, that was really uh, a very uh, thought-provoking answer and a very touching one as well. Right. Now we will move on uh, to uh, the next question. While you were reading out uh, those lines from your preface, I was uh, hooked at the word veracity and it uh, brought to mind another question. Uh, usually we associate story with the word history it has been associated with the word history and in early times professional bards and storytellers were the only historians they uh, you know wove together uh, mythical and gen genuine deeds of gods and heroes into histories now as uh, stories evolved uh, there was a big divide between history and fiction as we understand it today, both these uh, things are very different from each other. But again, while history deals with fact, it often adopts the story form. And while most of the stories are fictitious, they are sure to contain fact in greater or lesser degree. So I want to uh, listen uh, from you. How do your stories deal with this concept of veracity? You know, this is interesting when there is a tension between what is true and what is not quite true. So how do you deal with this concept while writing your stories? Okay. Okay, that is again a bit of challenging a question, isn't it? So dealing with veracity, somewhere uh, in the introduction, I have written, I don't remember where, I have written that at the cost of sounding autobiographical, I put my character traits into many of the stories. For example, there are two stories here, uh, the quarantine and the post-quarantine. These are two stories which are not at all autobiographical. Uh, in, in the entire uh, collection, uh, only Being God's Wife is a memoir where it's entirely my story, Being God's Wife. And the rest of the stories, like, well, a very different story is definitely my story. 
in rest of the stories uh, i have taken characters from my life and also i have taken characters who surround my my you know my family my my friend circle my university i have taken characters from those and uh, in this show the alternative masculinity uh, i use a lot of wit and humor it's a very humorous story if you read it carefully uh, alternative masculinity we need a lot of humor in indian literature once i was in uh, central university tamil nadu in a seminar of women poets and every poet was reading out very very emotional very sensitive very sentimental poetry even i also used to do that i was reading all my intense poems of human emotions and women and women's issues and social issues i was reading those in every woman poet was doing that they had invited five best women poets according to them and then a little girl a student of ba first year we honored she stood up she says ma'am i have a question a serious matter then she says ma'am why do women poets cry so much <laughs> she asked this question and then i said no they are not crying exactly uh, they are talking about the existential issues of life Uh, women have to be you know so strong in order to face the challenges of life i had my politically correct answer for her why women have to write all the existential issues but later on i reflected and then uh, i introspected and then i thought even men have equal number of challenges as we women have it's so difficult to be a man isn't it a man has to be a good father good husband good lover good son and a good employee he has to be good everything and he has to look good he has to he has to be the best in everything and this is such a big challenge and in 1970s when masculinity studies came up as a, a theoretical uh, research uh, topic uh, many people started talking about the retro man the perfect man male body and female gaze how women look at men recently we had a get together of all my classmates oh, uh, we were we were classmates in the 90s and today when there is a get together all women are looking perfect we find all women are beautiful and all men all the most men are pot bellied which they have no hair okay now they look so old and women look so beautiful uh, we, we were judging them we were whispering that look at us we are looking so young and beautiful and look all these men they are all they are like the uncles we were we are teasing them so even we do body shaming for men which we should not be doing we were just laughing at those classmates those boys and we were telling them hey you became my buddha you became an old man so then i thought that we should also write about men we should not only write about women and their challenges men challenges are also equally important and equally difficult like ours yes the children they want their papa to be perfect parents they want their son to be the best even after his marriage and for every small thing they will blame the wife that acha after marriage you became like this and the wife expects the husband to be the perfect man a great lover you know, throwing her back with orgasms you know, throughout her life and then also giving her all kinds of comforts i am a feminist i need not i should not be saying these things but i think as a humanist i should be saying these things so a man has to be perfect in everything so in this story alternative masculinity i am talking about a kind of toxic masculinity which is very very humorous in the beginning and at the end you have some questions in your mind so there is one person uh, he he tries to you know subvert his wife and then uh, he shows a kind of masculinity which is very very toxic and then uh, this this two stories the quarantine and the post quarantine they are not autobiographical but still i have taken a character whose character traits i mean whose behavior the way she talks the way she presents herself everything is like mine so i have taken myself into that character the person is not exactly me she is another ias officer who is my friend and this is the story of my ias officer friend but then i am putting my character into it so the fact of the matter is uh literature is very very complex to be a story writer to be a poet or to be a critic one has to really go through everything the layers of a character
In my uh, literary theory classes, I teach new historicism, Raymond Williams, and I teach cultural materialism. When you talk about cultural materialism, like I have taken texts from Manoj Das, a lady who died one and a half times. I've taken that as a part of my folklore courses. I have taken Sita Kant Mahapatra. I have taken Haldar Nag. Haldar Nag, widely translated to English now, I have taken his oral poetry as a part of my MA syllabus, MA in folk literature. I have taken Pratibha Ray, Jayanta Mahapatra. And I have tried to put my supervisor, late Professor Niranjan Mohanty's poetry in the syllabi of many universities when I go to design their syllabus. So as much as Odia literature, Balaram Das, Sarunath Das, so much of Odia literature in English translation I have taken in the national and international universities. But then in order to do that, you know, one has to actually uh, understand the nuances, the complexities, and also the social relevance. Mm -hmm. So when I say social relevance, when I say contemporaneity, I thought writing a story like alternative masculinity or writing a story like the quarantine or the other story like the post-quarantine, they have social relevance, they have contemporaneity. During COVID, I was writing these two stories. So maybe this is a little bit uh, to, to, to your satisfaction, though I don't know that uh, I can ever satisfy you with your uh, critical questions. <laughs> so ma'am, uh, I don't want to be satisfied and uh, neither do you, I'm sure, uh, because uh, this is a very interesting journey, talking about these stories. And uh, if we are not satisfied, then that's the best thing about uh, writing stories. If readers, uh, yes. you know, they are, they are not satisfied, then they would ask more and more questions and then yes. their thoughts would uh, lead the stories towards new directions. So, right. uh, and uh, while while you were uh, speaking about uh, these autobiographical elements, I was also wondering how difficult it would have been to, you know, modulate these autobiographical uh, points in your story. Because uh, yes, you are trying to have that uh, that balance between uh, truth and fiction, which is why. Uh, you know, you include some autobiographical elements, but they need not be completely your portrayal. They mix with uh, traits of other characters and we have a, an altogether different character in the story. Uh, so it was also, I, I, I was wondering, how do you modulate uh, those, uh, you know, self-presences in your stories? Was it difficult or was it spontaneous? I think it was impossible. It was not just difficult, you know, it's impossible. Uh, recently, uh, I had been to Odisha and then I saw that my paintings have been in the walls of the Bhubaneswar city. And there is this wall of fame where it's written that uh, the celebrities from Odisha, so they have painted my pictures and the Mahapatra's picture, many people, many Odia writers and many Odia celebrities like Nandita Das's picture, so many. And then I saw my painting. And then, uh, you know, I was happy. I just smiled. And then uh, I had a meeting with, in, uh, with one of the TV channels. And then they asked me, ma'am, please write your autobiography now. It's time that you write your autobiography. I said, no, life hasn't come to a full circle as yet. I think I will take some more time or probably I will never be able to write my autobiography. Because if I write my autobiography, I will not filter anything. I will write the truth. And if I write the truth entirely in non-fictional prose, in the process, probably I will hurt the sentiments of a few people around me. Sometimes you hurt the sentiments of some people in your family, among your friend circles. I think I'm not ready to do that as yet. But yes, maybe there is a time, maybe in future someday, I may gather myself to write my own autobiography. But uh, in the meantime, these 12 stories, many of them have little bit of autobiographical elements. And the next 12 stories, which are uh, ready to be published, which will come in the first three months of next year. Even there, I have a few autobiographical elements, like one of the stories is artificial intelligence. Now we are talking about AI, artificial intelligence so much, and how artificial intelligence has also affected my life in a way. It, there is a witty and humorous story, which is also scary at the end of the story. You will be so shocked that even this is happening. 
that world wide web is all over like above my head and above your head now artificial intelligence is working world wide web is working we don't know where it is taking us so it's real difficult but anyway this story being god's wife that's not the story i have written in memoir i have written very clearly being god's wife is a memoir uh, when i wrote that i was practically crying i was really really crying like sita when i wrote this poetry book sita uh, i did the research uh, for 3 years i read 300 ramayans i traveled across the ramayan maps of the world from nepal to to sri lanka uh, bali and to thailand to many places i went to so many places that cover the ramayan map of the world i took interviews with interesting scholars of the ramayan and then my registers were full six to seven registers were full of research for three years and this i had conceived this poem i thought i would write one long poem sita with 20 in 25 cantos and each canto will have a point of view authorial point of view i mean poet's point of view and the point of view of the ramayan and i have not taken any particular ramayan i haven't taken ram charitmanas i haven't taken valmiki's ramayan neither i have taken any particular uh, indigenous and folk ramayan but i have taken ideas from all of them which i have mentioned in the preface and in the in the cantos also i have given huge references to all the ramayans that i have read so after i had read 300 ramayans and then when i thought that i can't hold it any more my brain is going to give up uh, i am not able to hold any more then i took 18 days uh, el earned leave from my university and then i switched off my phones i asked my son to lock me inside the house every day every morning at 7 o'clock when he went to the school and then he came at 4 o'clock he would open the door so from 7 to 4 i did not even take a shower i would just brush my teeth eat something sit down and write i wrote the entire poem the complete book in 18 days oh, wow. i did the research for 3 years i wrote the complete book in 18 days i was locked in my house so it was like the mahabharat war was fought in 18 days similarly this was a war with myself i was struggling with myself what to write and what not to how much is too much how much to reveal how much to conceal because in this poem actually i am sita it's an entirely autobiographical poem so when i was writing that canto when sita is left alone in the forest during pregnancy and then what she talks to herself and to the planet earth what she talks to uh, i mean whatever she tells the rivers the mountains the green trees which i can call as a part of our you know green studies green studies and ocean humanities today everyone is talking about green studies and ocean humanities i have also research papers on green studies and ocean humanities so those technical and those theoretical ideas were in my mind when i was writing that canto so that is how i could balance myself you know i don't get swayed by emotions maybe because of i am maybe because i am very very theory corrupt i read a lot of literary theories i teach literary theories so uh, when i was crying uh, sita is sitting uh, beside the river and she is looking at the river and talking to herself at, at the, the last minute of her pregnancy she is left alone in the forest and then i remember something of my own life that um, even i was left alone during my pregnancy and uh, i had to give birth to a child all by myself and then i had to groom the child and i am a single mother so i was swayed by those kind of ideas of of my own life but i never wrote those things anywhere in the text i only focused on valmiki sita i focused on the contemporary sita like i see a kind of sita ness in you when you ask me intelligent questions when you ask me witty and intelligent questions which are very logical you are sita when i answer to you with honesty i am sita when mr abc he understands the pain of a woman he is sita so sita is not a person now sita is a cult i look at sita ness in every man and every woman who i come across and then i put that kind of a thing in the text so yes it's very difficult to hold your emotions not to be personal not to be subjective but to present your own pain 
through another character in an objective manner making that character your spokesperson is really very difficult and very challenging but maybe this is what is the difference between a writer and a person who is not a writer but a reader maybe this is the only difference between these two uh, these two kinds of people that uh, they manage to be objective be impersonal like ts eliot i would say that uh, i depersonalize myself i detach myself and then uh, the theory of impersonality it has come to my mind and i try to write but how much i am successful i don't know because many of the reviewers now there is a special issue of the creative saplings the entire journal we are reviewed journal they have taken out one entire issue on me on my writings with 15 20 interesting papers and a couple of writers who i don't know they have written that reading sita i could see nand them they could see me they could feel me and then somebody from australia writes that uh, reading sita uh i i want to make friendship with nandini because nandini is sita and then when i went to nepal they they rushed to touch my feet they said are sita mai aayi hai they thought i am sita so how much i am successful in becoming impersonal and how much i am successful in detaching myself from the character also i don't know but this is just a humble attempt as i said it's uh... such a beautiful thing the concept of sita ness and the way you have talked about uh this work of yours it leaves me tongue tied to to be honest i don't know how to respond to this answer because at this moment i am also experiencing some strong emotions emotions for you and emotions in connection with your work your writing what i want to say at this point is that for every writer it's very important to understand things deeply and understanding things that are happening to you if they are disturbing things especially that understanding is very different from understanding the things that we see happening to other people because if something has happened to you and you want to grasp it it is very difficult to grasp it actually and taking those emotions and molding them into a mahakavya uh, i see that the hindi translation of sita says it's a mahakavya and, and i like that uh, term more uh, in comparison to the english version it's a very difficult work and talking to a person who has been committed to creativity who has been committed to the study of theory and who has been committed to experiencing the world you know deeply i feel talking to such a person is very enriching it has been enriching for me because so many th- strands of thought have opened up while i am talking to you while i am listening to you so i feel very fortunate in interacting with you ma'am and you know you are beautiful not just outwardly you look beautiful today but i'm also touched by your humility and the beauty that is within you because i feel that stories are also and not also they are mostly about how these inward leanings have a bearing on how we live our lives and how we interact with others so it is very important for a writer to look inwards and to try to understand the contraries that we find within ourselves so it's a very very fertile session i would say fertile because i have gained so much from it and i am sure listening to yourself you would have so many new ideas and i believe you know you would look at yourself in in an altogether 
uh, new uh, light when, when you listen to yourself that also happens to you so and i'm sure our viewers they would relate to so many points in this interview from whatever you have said and they would have thoughts of their own pertaining to the ways they have lived and understood living so now i would like to uh, go towards uh, the last question which has come up in my mind you are a poet you have written so many collections of poetry and while reading your stories i found poetry in your stories as well in the first story i found a very beautiful poem and i would like to read it out for our viewers one night during our pillow talk hours she sent me a message rather a poem and then here goes the poem the night has stretched out a fresh watershed for me it squashed my eyes of slumber and packed the hollows with blubbering and said you have been acquitted of all offenses and hereafter you are at liberty till eternity go somewhere you wish rouse do be numb the entrance to reveries is padlocked but i feel that is a very beautiful poem and we have another beautiful poem that foot for my baba as you mentioned it's a uh, it's a memoir and it's written uh, for the father baba and that is a very beautiful poem indeed so i would like you to talk a little bit about what is different in being a poet and being a writer of stories and when i see that both these genres they come together in sharing the metaphors what it is like uh, to be a poet and a story writer at the same time okay thank you uh, let me respond to that respond to that uh, a little bit of humor in my uh, literary theory classes when i teach about uh, i teach poetry and also then i teach prose then the students ask me ma'am what is the difference between prose and poetry then i always tell them that uh, don't consider bad prose as poetry <laughs> okay <laughs> Because sometimes what children tend to do, they will write prosaic lines and then they will break, break, break the lines and then uh, put it in like a poetry form and then they think that this is poetry. But the language of poetry is entirely different, isn't it? It has it has symbolism, it has allegory, it has alliteration, similar metaphor. Everything is there in poetry. But having said that, uh, when I write prose. Uh, I mean, when I write stories, and then my research papers, I have 118 research papers published in many journals, and I'm a very, very serious researcher, working on American literature, on ecology, on culture, cultural studies, and folklore, and all that. So, these three are so different from each other. My research papers, if you read my research papers, uh, you will forget me as a poet. If you read my stories, you will never remember that she's a poet. If you read my poetry, you will forget my prose. so this is how i try to you know or detach myself but at the same time uh, the poet the folklorist and the teacher and the mother in me they keep on exchanging hands in many of my stories you will get the reference of my child my son parth sarathi sau so no so uh, these four people in me the teacher the mother uh, the poet uh, the creative writer and the folklorist they are so different from each other but again they are together So this is my uh, recent poetry collection, collected poems of uh, Nandini Sahu. So so many poems are there, and uh, in in that many of my published and published poems are there. And uh, then you know basically I was uh, interested in knowing you because I read your translation somewhere of this one of the Chotisha. This is a seminal work that you are doing. That is when I sent you a message. Already your messages were there in my messenger, and they were lying somewhere. I could not see them. Then I read your translations of Mano Vada Jyoti Sa Samha. Then I thought I should send a compliment to this girl. She is doing good translation. Then I saw your messages, and that is when we got connected. 
you are doing very very interesting translation and it is so challenging that you are translating manavadra chautisa and my stories have been translated nandini sahu ke suninda kahaniya by dinesh kumar malu ji and then this is a painting by my sister uh, gayatri dr gayatri sahu she is in the us and she is a scientist so this is a painting by her so this is a, a translated story man so all the stories of shedding the metaphors have been translated by dinesh kumar mali ji and sita mahakavya has also been translated by him so even my translator asks me that uh, you write poetic prose like just now you said i write poetic prose i experiment with champu my poetry collection uh, karno which is under publication is written in champu and i have followed tripadi and yeah. saptapadi formats and uh, i i like to write uh, poetic prose or maybe when i write prose poetry keeps on coming rhyming and or words and all that they keep on coming and uh, well about to uh, me as a person uh, i would say that i am an incorrigible lover i fall in love with every every single person i come across i fell in love with you with everybody all my readers and my children my child my students my colleagues i am basically a lover i love everyone i hate nobody why i am telling this you know in order to be a writer first you have to get rid of that why me syndrome why do i suffer so much why do so many pain so many kinds of pain and suffering they come to me why i mean this why me syndrome one has to get rid of that you should not be like self having self pity there should be no self pity and you should be confident in yourself in order to be a writer and another thing is a lot of bad things happen to us sometimes like life does a raw deal with many of us and we are human beings so we definitely uh, would be angry would be upset would be sad and sorry about those things but at one point of time you have to forgive yourself and you have to forgive the people who might have hurt you so that you can write objectively i can write objectively with no hatred for anyone from my past who might have done injustice to me or my i might have done injustice to them the perspectives are different my perspective is they have hurt me their perspective can be i might have hurt them so you have to forgive yourself first you have to forgive those people and then you have to build a story you know you have to think that this is a part of my life a chunk of my life a slice of my life which has to be presented in the form of a story so that in future nobody suffers the way i did or he did or she did so in this story you know this memoir being god's wife in a confessional mode i have written somewhere that at one point of my life when i was in my early 20s and i was going through turmoil in my personal life i was pregnant i was losing uh, my pregnancies and i was you know i was going through a lot of physical and mental stress i was going through depression when my in my early 20s and at that point of time when my i saw my father watching tv and getting involved with the characters in the television once i went to him and i told him that you were crying looking at those girls can you see my tears i am your girl and at that time i was so angry with him i wanted him to hold my hand i wanted him to tell me that i am with you but he could not do so i was so angry at that point of time but now at this mature age i realize that he was going through dementia dementia had already started coming to him isn't it so he was forgetful and just to spend his time just to kill time he used to watch tv a lot and he was to get used to get involved with the characters in the tv he he wanted to connect to relate to those characters and then uh, I, when i was so angry he was not with me and then even i was not with him he was going through mental health issues so you have to forgive some people from your past and you have to look at the mental health of yourself and the people around you so dementia mental health conditions uh, so if you look at that story being god's wife i have given so many examples where i wanted my father my mother to be with me but they could not be and even i could not be there with them and now i realize that the the story was something different 
isn't it? Different and very touching and beautiful. And uh, at this point, ma'am, I would like you to read that poem the story contains about your father. Achha, achha, that food? Yes. Okay. I would like you to read it for our viewers. Okay. It's on page 251. Yes, I opened. Yes. Okay, fine. So let me just give an introduction to that. Uh, yes. I wish I would not have been running the race of life at the time as a single mother for Sonu, searching for a central government job and doing a PhD, while struggling to run errands for two of us with just a junior research fellowship from Shantide Ketan. I wish I could have told my father loud and clear, quote unquote, Baba, I need you now. Save me from drowning into this bottomless pit. Hold my hand. In return, I will hold your hand and take you happily to the lanes of childhood through Sonu's infancy, Sonu's juvenile joy. But a lot of things remained unspoken between me and Baba. During his last few weeks, after a sudden brain hemorrhage, I was with him in Apollo Hospital, Bhubaneswar, where Baba was in the ICU, his mouth open, eyes moist, where he was waffling the quotes he had mugged up from the books of wisdom. It was therapeutic for me to take care of my father there. I don't know if he understood that. Even I heard my father whisper, God is in the heaven and all is right with the world. I wrote a poem for him in the hospital and read it aloud to him. I don't know if he could hear that poem. And now the poem, that foot for my Baba. That foot has walked with turns all through the day for you. That foot which has shown you footsteps to follow. That foot. That foot behind the orange sun has walked through Arsis barefoot, on fire, on water, near the parapets, has cracked doors and windows for you to enter safe. That foot, that foot walked, crossed the never-ending roads when you aspired for the closer. That foot, your passport to Utopia, to dream of new truths, passport to planets uncharted. That foot is walking away, weak, putting, parting with fantasia forever. Will you join? So with the end of this poem, I talk about poetry as therapy, literature as witness, art for art's sake. These are the concepts that Baba had taught me. He was a happy man with zero understanding of adulterations and the ways of the world. After months in the hospital, the doctors advised us to take him home. He was sent home in an ambulance. That was the last I saw of him. I touched his feet. So this is a part of that memoir, Being God's Wife. A beautiful reading indeed by you. And at this point, I would like to also tell you that you have such a soothing voice. And all this while I have been enjoying that uh, soothing feeling. So thank you so much, ma'am, for agreeing to do this interview with me today. And IFEST is really happy to have you as their guest. And we would like to welcome you again whenever you have your new books published. Do let us know. And we would like to have you again in another session of Unmute as well. Today's session has been very beautiful and I have gained a lot in talking to you and I have been inspired by you. And I have been inspired by the academician in you and I have also been inspired by the person who experiences life, takes things as they come and includes them in the pages of writing. So this has been a very beautiful experience for me and we would like to conclude 
this session today by thanking you once again. And if you'd like to uh, end the session with some closing words for our viewers, please, you're welcome. I really don't know how to conclude it. It has been so beautiful talking to you. I opened up with my heart and I just tried to be honest, truthful and humble. And whatever you asked me, I tried to respond. And thank you so much for inviting me, Dr. Satarupa. Uh, we're looking forward to working with you in future. Whoever is interested among your students, including yourself, of course, whoever is interested in folklore and culture studies, indigenous knowledge systems, Indian knowledge systems, Hindu studies and comparative Indian literatures, if you or your students want to collaborate with me, please get in touch with me. I'm here to help your students. Uh, I love to do that. I do love, I love to guide and help the research scholars. And please get in touch with me. Thank you and Namaskar. Thank you so much, ma'am, for that offer. I would definitely get in touch with you and I would love to work with you. Thank you so much for being with us today and for sparing your valuable time. And uh, we wish you uh, all the best for your forthcoming collections and uh, works of art. And here we would like to end the seventh episode of Unmute with Professor Dr. Nandini Saho. Thank you, everyone.